Well, it's a real honor uh, for me to have a chance to let you listen in on a conversation that I'm about to have with truly one of the great military leaders of our time, served for many years as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Hugh Shelton. General, thanks for joining us today well, here in Phoenix. Thank you very much, Ron. It's a pleasure to be with you. You are here for an event at the downtown Sheraton on countering the rise of Islamic fundamentalism and preventing a nuclear-armed Iran, two huge topics. Uh, at the end of our interview, we'll give folks a little more information on how they can attend and get a chance to listen to you a little more in depth. But I want to address both of these issues one at a time. What, in your opinion, has led to the rise of Islamic extremism, terror groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda? And what do you think is the most effective way to turn that around? Well, Ron, first and foremost, I think the problem that we're really facing now in, in the Middle East, throughout the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, has a genesis that goes back to Iran. And it is, it is a, a fact that Iran is the nation state that exports more terrorism than any other in the world. We know that for a fact. Uh, and now, since we saw Syria start to go downstream, this small faction of ISIS that was in Iraq being fueled and supported by Iran moved quickly into Syria and then turned around and came back to carry out Iran's goals for Iran with Maliki, who was there in, in Iraq at the mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. And so now you've got Iraq and Iran. It's spread over now into Yemen. It was already in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. We're seeing it flare up now in, in uh, Libya as well as in Egypt. But it all goes back to the Iranian influence and their goals to be the dominant force in the Middle East. So are you saying that ISIS is doing the bidding of Iran? I am saying that, that they're doing the bidding of Iran and that Iran is the, is the one that is fueling, supporting, supplying ISIS. And I, I think we need to face the hard, cold facts that without Iran's involvement in this, ISIS would not be nearly the, the issue that it is today, nor would it be the threat that we're facing in the Middle East. All right. So how do we go after ISIS? Do we go after Iran? I mean, are, are uh, potentially, it, would there be a looming military conflict with Iran, or can we contain and... I really want to tap into your military mind here. Okay. Specifically, how do we go after ISIS that has now spread beyond a traditional nation border? I mean, do we have to have ground troops that approach from multiple different fronts? It does ultimately have to be one on the ground, doesn't it? Well, it does, without a doubt. But it also has to be won by, we, we've got to set our goals of winning that go above the, the, just a military operation. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a battle about the minds. It's the extremists, the, the radical arm of Islam that is creating the problems for us. It's not the, the moderate, the fundamental is, mm -hmm. Islamist in the region. Mm -hmm. We need to tap into those great supporters that we've got. You know, when I would talk to the kings or the crown princes, anyone over there. My good friend, King Abdullah, a great leader. Mm -hmm. I've known him a long time. These are the moderates. They, they want the U.S. to be there to provide stability. By the mm -hmm. way, we've been in the Middle East for with over 25,000 troops for the last 50 years, mm -hmm. providing stability. Mm -hmm. And they all appreciate what the U.S. does to provide stability. So we need to capitalize on the moderates pull out these, the dissidents from Iran that are in Iraq right now, trapped in Camp Liberty, get them to working force, tap into the vast resources they bring to it in terms of intelligence, knowledge of the region, friends throughout the region, friends inside of Iran, intelligence links inside of Iran. We, we need to work this part of it a lot harder than we're working it right now because ultimately we cannot win this just with the current strategy a strategy which, by the way, as some have called, is a little bit fuzzy about how long we might be there, mm -hmm. about what the limits that we've placed on our forces are. Mm -hmm. the, the enemy reads that very clearly. You know, they think in terms of years, not in terms, I mean, in terms of 10 years, decades, not in terms of just two or three years. Well, that is one of the criticisms as we speak today of the president. As you know, he j has just gone to Congress to get the authorization, yes. but some are saying that he uh, doesn't have a clear plan. Uh, that he seems to spend as much time talking about what he's not going to do as what he is going to do. What's your, what's your input on that and how he's handling it? Well, first of all, I, I know the president's in a really tough position right now, 
but you never divulge your plan to the enemy in terms of the length of time that you're going to be there, in terms of the force levels that you're willing to commit to the fight if necessary to win. You go into battle saying, I'm going to use all the resources available, not just the military, diplomatic, economic, uh, and, and you start to try to contain your enemy. Now, if you know that the genesis of the problem is coming out of Iran, you want to apply as much pressure on them as you possibly can. That means the sanctions are hurting them badly. Let's don't sign up for a, uh, a half-baked uh, uh, treaty. Mm -hmm. uh, give them, keep lowering the bar till we can get them to say, okay, we agree. When they keep telling you we're going to continue to enrich uranium, which six UN resolutions have said no Iranian uh, enrichment is allowed. Mm -hmm. Now we're saying we'll allow some enrichment. That, we're not even addressing weaponization. We're not really making sure that we can inspect those key sites to include where they're doing their nuclear testing. Not a part of the deal. So we need to, we need to start containing Iran, get them back in their box, as we now use our, our moderate Muslim friends in that region to start to try to defeat ISIS from a political and diplomatic as we also provide them with the weapons and the limited support the president has promised try to help them fight militarily so they don't lose on the ground while we're getting the, putting the moderate funda fundamental uh, Islamic forces in place to defeat them. One of the things that I find really fascinating about this interview we're having right now is, here I see you uh, in your now retired role as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and thinking in terms of the big picture. I wanted to come into this interview and ask very specific military planning type questions. And so I see, I see where, you're, where you're going and long term how this has to be won. But let me ask a couple of more specific questions. Okay. For example, this fight against ISIS, can it be done with U.S. troops only in an advisory role or assisting maybe at the front line? Uh, or in your opinion, will U.S. troops, perhaps in large numbers, be required to defeat this enemy? Well, I think the president's attempt to do it in the, in the manner that he's doing it right now, in an advisory role, providing a limited number of weapons, giving them some close air support, which they don't have in, 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 with a few exceptions, is the right way to, to start. But I think that we need to understand that I, ISIS has, is a threat that we can't allow to, to win the Middle East, to own the Middle East. It's the only region in the world that in our national security strategy is deemed a, a vital national interest, meaning that we will fight if necessary to preserve that area. So let's say right up front, we'll do what it takes. But I think starting the way we are, trying to train the forces on the ground so that they can defeat ISIS, but also so they can protect their own borders, their own countries when we leave and when we pull our force structure down is the right answer. Should we have tried harder to get a status of forces agreement prior to leaving Iraq the way we did? Ron, I don't think there's any question. The way we left Iraq has ended up with it being the shamble that it is right now. Uh, we didn't have a good plan for pulling out. We basically turned out the lights, turned, got on the planes and left. Why do you think that is? I think the president had made a campaign promise to get us out of Iraq and he wanted to, he wanted to see that through. Uh, I don't think that, I mean, I know that in the discussions in the National Security Council, what would potentially happen if we did it that way surfaced and was discussed. Mm -hmm. But I think the overriding consideration was we're going to get out. You know, we've spent 10 mm -hmm. years training their forces. They should be able to. But let's remember, we had a, we had a, a president in there, Maliki, that we all knew was, was not on our side. He already had shown signs that the Iranians were controlling him and pulling his strings, supporting him in every way, shape, and form. And so, we should have made, we should have stayed, we should have fought hard to get a status of forces. We should have used our economic tool more than we did in order to make him come on our side and, and do it the way we'd like to have it done so that he could sustain himself. Are you confident we will not make the same mistake in Afghanistan? Uh, I am not confident that we won't make the same mistake. I would hope that we learn our lesson in Iraq and that that will be an overriding consideration. I am, I am, uh, optimistic now that we have Senator McCain as head of the Senate Armed Services Committee that the Senate Armed, that, that the Congress will play a larger role in that regard and so from that in that respect I think Senator McCain can play a very significant role in not letting us make the same mistake all right so um, 
couple of other questions that I, that I want to get to is uh, particularly related to, uh, well, I want to get into a little bit more. I, I know you've got a book out that uh, uh, every, every website I look at is getting great reviews. I want to talk a little bit about that and specifically about your recollections of 9-11. But let me just ask uh, in a larger sense here, everybody in this country realizes since 9-11 that we have faced this continued threat from Islamic terrorism. And yet here we are more than 13 years later and we have thrown so many military resources at the problem. We have seen Americans in large number be willing to go to the Middle East to try to help in humanitarian areas. It seems as though we've done so many things that should have perhaps gotten us further down the road than we are. Why have we not made more progress than we have so far 13 years plus after 9-11? It's a great question, Ron, and I, I would say first and foremost, I think we were doing really well in Afghanistan. Uh, that's a tough one to a tough one to deal with. We knew that going in. In fact, the CIA director said it on on 12 September, the first meeting we had in the National Security Council, you're going to have to win over that country from the warlords, the 12 warlords they have, and, and that's going to be a tough thing to do for a central government. We knew it would be hard to do, but that was, we, it was starting to develop pretty well, and then. Unfortunately, we made the mistake of going into Iraq in 2002, and that divided our attention. I must say the military didn't come through with shining colors there because they suffered in silence as the forces were pulled down in Afghanistan to support the war in Iraq. Our poor troops were being run ragged trying to support both of these contingencies, making multiple rotations, terrible injuries coming out of both sides. But we, we allowed that division of attention to let both start to come down and basically reached the point where when we sent McChrystal in, he said, this place is collapsing. I need 30,000 troops immediately. And the White House, of course, rebelled and uh, pushed back. But it's a long story. But the bottom line is, is that we, we divided our attention. We didn't concentrate and focus on, on getting. And to be very candid, I don't think we continue to monitor it the way we should have. As we saw Maliki going south on us, coming under more and more the influence of, of the Iranians every day. And finally, we just decided to, we'd almost cut and run instead of try to get those forces up and running the way they should have. I, it is very disheartening to, as you point out, to have been there that long and not have left a more stable uh, platform in place, if you will, meaning the troops that could protect their own central government and that we're going to be loyal to the president, et cetera. And it seems like it will be so much harder to have to go in now and address some of those as here we are talking about authorization. Force. It's disheartening to the troops that have got to go back again and try to fix it again as well as to the American people who say, wait a minute, we've, we've already spent a trillion dollars. You know, what did that get us? I mean, we hear the arguments every day now and, you know, I have to say they're right. They, it's, yeah. It is disheartening. Um, all right. So you were in a position of the highest authority as chairman of the Joint Chiefs on our nation's darkest day in any of, in any of our recent memories, 9-11. You were on a flight that day, I believe, that actually turned around and went back to Washington. Can you pick up your day from there? I can. It was, uh, first of all, being denied permission to come back into America because now we had turned it over to NORAD. No longer the DFAA have control and NORAD had basically shut it down and yeah. said, get everything on the ground because we're going to shoot everything that's coming in. Yeah. So I told my pilot, you know, it was an Air Force pilot up front in the 757. I said, we'll ask forgiveness, not permission. Let's go. Wow. So he turned it around and started coming back. Well, I got the deputy on the phone and told him, tell NORAD we're coming back to Andrews. And mm -hmm. so we did. And we flew right over 9-11, right over uh, the Twin Towers, smoke billowing up to 10,000 feet as we came down the coast. Uh, and it was the most sickening sight I'd ever seen. There in the heart of our financial district was uh, the smoke billowing up. Uh, very, but at any rate, I got back. I was escorted by, I think it was about 13 Washington policemen on motorcycles that were there to meet my plane. And I, everything else was still. Nothing was moving. So it, it was a kind of an eerie feeling. It made the hound the back of the neck stand up to see the nation's capital shut down. But I went back to the Pentagon. They were still removing bodies from the Pentagon. Uh, Cordite 
smoke fill my office when I went in. It was a, a pretty gruesome scene. Went, uh, gathered up my stuff, went up to Secretary Rumsfeld's office at the time where Senator Warner and Senator Levin had just come in and was there for about 15 or 20 minutes discussing where we were and what the next steps were. And then we went straight to the Pentagon press room to give the first really live press interview with any of the government officials since then. Of course, President Bush's whereabouts were still being sorted out. And so we did that press conference, tried to reassure the American people that the military was ready to take on whoever it was that did this, and, we'd, and we would start getting this sorted out immediately and go after them. And then from there, I went back to my office and started reviewing our contingency plans against everybody because we didn't know who had done it. But I must admit, I was concentrating on Al-Qaeda, what we had on them, because I'm 99% sure that's where it was going to come from. Next morning, it was back over to the White House, laying out for the president everything we had in terms of military options at that point against Al-Qaeda and going into a discussion about where we go from here. If I recall, it was that next morning that some cameras were allowed in the Oval Office and we saw President Bush perhaps at his most emotional as he uh, recalled the loss of life. That was, uh, that was a very powerful moment as well. You, um, uh, so then the meetings began. Did you also go out to Camp David or were most of these meetings structured right there at the White House no, as we, you quickly formulated a plan? No, we, uh, we also, we, we went over the preliminary plans, but then very quickly decided a much longer session was going to be required at Camp David. It gave some time for the intelligence communities to kind of sort out what they had. It gave uh, us a chance to work with the CIA and start looking at what they already had on the ground in Afghanistan that we could team with or marry up with and provide military capabilities to what we already had working, uh, you might say, in a, uh, in a behind the scenes role with the, with the Northern Alliance against the incumbents, the Taliban and the, and the Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. And so we put all that together and that's what we did at the next meeting out at Camp David. Does it seem to you, or did it seem to you at the time that there was uh, almost immediately uh, a surprising amount of focus on Iraq since Al Qaeda had been doing most of its training in Afghanistan? Uh, I'm talking about discussions now you would have had at the highest levels with the president. Well, yes, it was. As a matter of fact, it started the night right after we finished the press conference in the Pentagon, and I went back, gathered my stuff from, from my office, and went up to Secretary Rumsfeld's office. And it was there that he and uh, Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz both viewed this as an opportunity to take out Saddam, you know, to, to now do what we would, had been so frustrated being shot at. And, you know, never being able to really go after Saddam himself. Right. We could retaliate, but not against the man. And so uh, they started pushing immediately, and my pushback on that was is that our intelligence, our intelligence, the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, had zero linking al-Qaeda to Iran. And so if they're or not Iraq. in Iraq in this case, yeah. if they weren't in Iraq, why would we attack Iraq? And we'd look more like the Western infidels who were now attacking Iraq just to gain the oil. They would use that against us, mm -hmm. you know, or social media or whatever. Yeah. So uh, they disagreed. And so when we got to the, uh, the White House the next morning, I had two big briefcases filled with our, our Iraq plans as well in mm -hmm. case that was to get into a discussion. Both myself and uh, Secretary Powell pushed back. Uh, Secretary Rumsfeld uh, started talking about attacking Iraq. Wolfowitz kind of stood up from the back row and started really hammering home with the president that we needed to go after Iraq. Uh, myself and Powell both pushed back, saying without the intel, this, we should not do it. And uh, the president said, well, we're not going to attack Iraq right now. That's not our focus, both Bob Mueller from the, from the FBI as well as George Tennant from the CIA, both say this is Afghanistan-based al-Qaeda. There's no al-Qaeda linkage to Iraq. We're going after al-Qaeda, not Iraq. And so I thought that would be the end of it. The president was pretty clear. Well, when we got out to Camp David, uh, no sooner had we started the briefing than Wolfowitz stands up from the back row and says, Mr. President, there's an ideal time to go after Iraq. I thought the president pretty much put a harpoon through his chest at that point saying, let's, let's quit discussing that. We're going to focus on, on Afghanistan. At the, uh, at the break, the president came up to me and President Bush and said, uh, what am I missing? What am I not getting here that, that links this to Iraq? And I said, Mr. President, 
you have got a, uh, you've got a very clear sight picture of what's going on. We need to go after Afghanistan. And the president said, I, I, that's what we're going to do. You know, we're not going after, he said, we'll get those guys later at a time and place of our choosing. But right now we're going to focus on the real enemy, which is Al Qaeda. This is fascinating to have you take us right into the hallways, right into the, the boardroom. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been asked this question before, but you did serve under two presidents. What was the leadership style difference between President Clinton and President Bush? You know, I would say right up front, both of them were great presidents to serve for from a chairman's standpoint. Uh, both of them would listen intently. They would, uh, they would listen to every word you were saying. They could very quickly uh, pick out what the risks were if it was an operation you were proposing, uh, ask about that risk, what we were going to do to minimize the risk or whatever. Uh, so they both were very intelligent and insightful. I mean, I know one of them has that reputation. The other one kind of has a reputation of deer in the headlights, but they both really focused well. And uh, I always appreciated that. They both were always very concerned about the men and women in uniform. You know, what's this going to cost us in terms of lives and injuries, et cetera? So I always had to have that at my fingertips in terms of what the, what the estimates were that we were dealing with. Uh, militarily, I, I was in a habit of getting to meetings early, and it was kind of unusual to find myself sitting there with one-on-one -on -one with the president because I was the only one to show up on it before. <laughs> that only happened a few times Still. before suddenly everyone started getting there early. Yeah. So, uh, but their leadership styles were, their idiosyncrasies were a little bit different, but they were both great presidents to serve for. You are a proud NC State alum. Well, fact. And uh, you've uh, helped to establish a leadership center there to pass along some of the most important aspects that, of leadership that you have learned. For those who are watching us today and will never have the chance to even visit the campus, uh, let alone be part of your leadership institute, give us some of the important lessons in life that you have learned when it comes to these leadership skills and uh, things we can all learn. Well, Ron, I was asked to do that right on the heels of the collapse of Enron, and I had stood out in the, in the, uh, in the top floor of the Enron building about three weeks before it, it went down, and I thought things were looking pretty rosy for them at the time, as did most Americans. Uh, we had a number of other large corporations that failed. I had seen some, what uh, some missteps by leaders in the military had done to their careers, and so when I was asked to set this up and be a part of it, I kind of jumped at it because I had worked for so many great leaders throughout my career. And uh, so I said, why don't we form a center that focuses on the, the, what the great leaders, what attributes they've had, and the things that have caused them to make others to make errors along the way. So we focus on, you know, the fact, simple things, but the leader sets the example. You know, the, the leader uh, takes care of his people. The, the leader looks at what the risks are to both his people as well as the organization. And we, we basically go through a whole litany of just attributes that good leaders have, such as those, and uh, try to instill that in our young people. And uh, it's, the feedback is absolutely amazing. Young people really, they, they eat this stuff up. And, and then several parents have come to me over the years and said, you changed my, my son or my daughter's life just in this one week of experience with the leadership camps that you run. Hmm. Uh, it's turned their lives around. And so that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up when you hear that, because these were good kids to start with. They'd been <laughs> recommended by, sure. by, school, by teachers, et cetera. You've studied, well, and you mentioned, uh, it's an opportunity to look through the lives of previous military leaders and you know, uh, pick up the good points and discard the bad. Over the course of your studies, who would you say it was the most brilliant military mind or who influenced you perhaps the most? You know, I've wor I worked for a, really, a lot of really great leaders along the way, but let me also say I've incorporated over the last 12 years what I've seen in the corporate world as well. Okay. And you know, the skill sets are the same. Mm -hmm. and, and I find that the corporate leaders do the very same thing the military leaders mm -hmm. do, the good ones do, taking right. care of their people. Right. And the bad ones operate very similar to the way the, that we try to weed out of the military. Mm -hmm. So. But uh, when I look back at it, there were a number of people. I worked for a great general by the name of Carl Steiner who led the uh, Panama invasion. Uh, I worked for General Jim Lindsay, a first uh, commander of the Special Operations Community. Uh, not, not so well known, but, but two really great leaders and great guys, retired four stars now. 
Uh, you know, I worked uh, very closely and, and were for Colin Powell, and, and Colin was a great leader, particularly when it came to balance that, uh, balancing the diplomatic skills along with his military skills. You know, he, he was a great one to learn from. Mm -hmm. So I'd say those were the, uh, on a personal basis, the three. And from a historical standpoint, over the sweep of time? You know, I've got to go back to the first chairman, uh, Omar Bradley. Okay. Uh, a brilliant man, mm -hmm. and uh, I learned a lot from him. I used to look at the couch in my office, and you know, in his memoirs, he talks about taking a nap sometimes between two and four, so he could refresh himself uh -huh. and be. I never had time because of the <laughs> because of the internet. Now there's something going on around the world 24 <laughs> hours a day, and so the nap time had to go. But right. a lot of other things that he did, I learned from and, and tried to incorporate in my own leadership style. When it comes to leadership, is it necessary in this fight that we all understand is a long fight, and and one that you're going to be addressing at this conference on Friday, is it necessary that the nation have an almost Churchill type of leader to guide us through, to inspire us, to continue to support the efforts that are going to be necessary to defeat Islamic extremism in its terrorist form. Uh, there, you know, there are some obviously who who say we don't seem to have that right now. Well, and I think Ron, that is the that is the key role of the president. One of the things we learned out of Vietnam: if you don't have the American people behind you no matter what your strategy is, you're going to face great difficulty being able to carry it out. The people have got to be with you. They've got to understand how important this fight is and say, we've got to go after them. And as you said, it's a Churchill-type leader. Uh, I believe that, that's the, that we're lacking on that a little bit mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. uh, going to Congress and getting them to sign up and trying to at least support, at least, even if in a half-hearted manner, mm -hmm. is not the same as bringing the people along with you. Mm -hmm. I, they have... And if you've got them, the Congress normally will come along as well because they'll know that the people that they represent, this is something that they would like to have, see happen as well. So it, it takes that. And unless we've got that, it won't last very long. You won't be able to carry out that long-term strategy that you may need to defeat ISIS. Uh, people who are watching may not be aware of the... Uh the personal health challenge that you had to deal with several years ago, but I remember very clearly the day I had to report that you had had an accident at home that left you partially paralyzed. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened to you that day and how you rose to that health challenge uh, as strongly as you did? Well, first of all, I was very fortunate. But let me start back with, the, I was up on a ladder trimming trees. A lot of people say, why didn't you hire someone to do it? Uh -huh. And the answer is, I'm kind of a hands-on. I've uh -huh. always enjoyed doing work around the house. Yeah. Or I grew up on a farm, so I was used to fixing things. And so it was, uh, it was a joy to go out and do that. It kind of cleared you, the cobwebs out and gave you time to think. But uh, on that particular day, unfortunately, a little limb fell off and hit this outside arm of a ladder and twisted it. And suddenly, I just found myself having to leave the ladder. So I did a little bunny hop. I was only five feet, only five feet off the ground, which isn't very high from a guy who's made 450 parachute jumps. Some of them as high as uh, 30,000 feet. Okay. So it's not the altitude that gets you; it's the landing. <laughs> and in this case, the cyclone fence about a foot below me caught my toes. My momentum carried me forward, and I hit on my head, and I was instantly paralyzed from the neck down. Nothing moved, no arm movement, no hands, no legs. Uh, my wife uh, was notified by a neighbor that, uh, who heard me hollering, help. Uh, she called 911. They, uh, my wife fortunately called uh, a friend who was commanding Walter Reed, who had been our next door neighbor at Fort Bragg, who said, I'm going to send a couple of guys down to the local hospital to check him out. And he sent down the chief neurosurgeon and chief spine surgeon from Walter Reed, who immediately said, we got to get you out of here. We've got work to do. They flew me out to Walter Reed. Uh, I had been told while I was in a local hospital, the surgeon said, I've got to tell you right now, General, I'll give you the bad news up front. I've seen a lot of these. You'll never walk again, nor will you be able to use your hands. Hmm. He said, we'll be lucky if we can get your hands so they can use the toggles on a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I looked up at him and I said, uh, I can't see you, your name tag. I said, hopefully your name's not God, is it? 
<laughs> and he said, no, it's not. I said, well, they're good. We'll see about that. <laughs> and I was very optimistic even then. He, I probably wasn't smart enough to realize how bad the injury was. Yeah. But at Walter Reed, they never told me that either. They mm -hmm. encouraged me yeah. uh, to include trying to walk the second day I was there. Mm -hmm. And of course, nothing moved, but they got me up and moved me anyway. So 83 days later, I walked out of Walter Reed. A little bit shaky, but able to walk. And so uh, I thank God for the great care I got at Walter Reed, the fact that we had some of the most dedicated doctors and therapists and staff in the world, and they got me back on my feet. All right. Well, uh, we sure appreciate your time and the insights that you've been able to share with us today. Thank you, Ron. It's and, a pleasure uh, to be here. People who want to have a chance to hear you uh, at uh, even greater levels of uh, your in-depth analysis, this is Friday at 3.30 at the Sheraton downtown. Uh, it's it's uh, you're here as the guest of the Iranian American community of Arizona yes. and we'll set up a link to their website on our website fox10phoenix.com if you'd like to attend that general great thanks Ron an honor to meet you a very pl pleased to meet you as well a pleasure to be here thank you